Hey everybody, Jason here from AV Pro, and I have two very special guests today, and we're going to talk a lot about this little guy right here, the Spears of Munsell disc. Stacy, Don, how are you? Great. Happy to be here. Thank well, you guys thank you. for being here. I um I am very excited about this disc because um I've been I've been buying it since the beginning. Um, it was uh it was a very handy tool uh, for me uh, calibrating because you know we would plug the generator into the TV and get the TV sorted out, but we had no idea what the Blu-ray player was doing. So order of operations for me was plug the generator into the TV, get the TV sorted out, then take the disc, put it in the player, make adjustments to the disc, everything was happy. And without that disc, without that tool, you just never knew what was going on with the Blu-ray player. So um, the new version of the disc came out. I've been through it. I've spent a couple hours on it. I think it's awesome. You guys did a killer job. Not that I was expecting anything else, but um, I, I wanted to have you on and just talk about it and talk about why it's important and um, why we think it's cool and how it can help how it can help people in the field. Um, for those of you who are watching, listening live, thank you for coming. Uh, there is a chat box. So if you guys have any questions for me, Stacy or Don, feel free to type those questions in. Uh, we'll get them as we go. And uh, if we don't get them, then we'll we'll save some time at the end. So, Stacy, Don, I wanted to talk to you guys about because um, I'm interested in this myself. Where did you guys come from? How did this all start? Uh, I'll tell you. I guess at, we both were working at Microsoft. This is uh, 20, almost 25 years ago, um, and not neither of us in the video group, but Stacy was in his spare time. You know, we were both video aficionados, and uh, he had written an article for uh, Secrets of Home Theater and Hi-Fi, and mm -hmm. I read it, and something about the bio, I don't remember what it was in it, but I thought, he might be at Microsoft, and... I, you know, typed his name into the email box and sure enough, he was there and I just sent him an email saying, hey, are you the Stacey Spears who wrote this article? I had a question and, you know, we talked, we got together like the next day for lunch and uh, we just talked about video and we we're very, you know, simpatico in our ideas about what quality video should be like and things like that. And I don't know, it's just been a very fruitful collaboration. We uh, worked on the DVD, progressive DVD shootout, and that was really good. We were able to develop some tools and really investigate like how different DVD players did the progressive scan. And we really learned a lot about what deinterlacing was all about. Mm -hmm. Wrote all that up for a big article that was, you know, got a lot of attention and that led one thing led to another. And eventually somebody asked us to make a few test patterns and some, then somebody asked us to make a disc and, you know, <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> yeah, here we are. Years you know, Don, Don likes to tell that story about tracking me down through the global address book, but personally, I think he was on Hotbot searching for me all over the internet <laughs> yes. back then. This predates Google, so. Ask Jeeves. That's Who right. Stacey Spears? <laughs> That's right. And he just contacted every one of them he could find. Yeah. Um, yeah so well, there were also two Stacey Spears at Microsoft at that time as well, so. Well, that's not confusing. Yeah, but one was S-T-A-C-Y and was female, so, yeah. That's cool. They, uh, when when you guys had this um, kind of epiphany, if you will, um, what like if you had to guess, like wh around what year would this may have, may have been? Well, I think we did the first article around 2000, so it was okay. 99 or 2000 when we met. To, yeah. That's funny because um, I started getting into this hardcore um, right around like 2001, and um, I'll never forget this. I, I was working at a store called Sound Advice. You guys may may be familiar with it, but it was it was a high end AV. A retail store based out of Florida and only in Florida and we had Mitsubishi Diamond and Krell and B&W and a really killer car audio set up and um, at the time as a young guy um, you know I was just still learning and I come in one morning and one of my salespeople who is more of the techie sales guys uh, he's in one of the rooms with the lights off and he's got this blanket over one of the Mitsubishi Diamond series CRTs and I'm like, what is he doing in there? And he's like, oh, I'm adjusting the TV so it can look better. And I'm like, what? You can make it look better? Like, that is so cool. Um, mm -hmm. And the disc was the Avia Guide to Home Theater. And that, and that was my first disc back in those days. And, you know, it had some cool patterns on it and, and some cool audio stuff on it. And, you know, at the time it was the cat's meow. And, uh, you know, fast forward a couple years and there was like digital video essentials and a couple other discs. Disney had the wow disc. And then all of a sudden, one year, I find this disc called Spears and Munsell. And I'm like, okay, this is cool. I'll add this to the collection. 
And as I started getting into it, I was like blown away. I'm like, wait a second, this is way more detailed than the other discs. I can push a button on the remote and get a description of what I'm supposed to be actually doing here. And, um, and that was kind of my, my, my kickoff to, to using, to using your guys' disc. And of course the second one came out, the third one came out and now the, and now the fourth one came out and it's still part of my everyday toolkit, uh, when I calibrate. Um, so what I wanted to, to talk to you guys about today are some of the test patterns and some of the things you might do when you're encountering a TV, maybe for the very first time. I, I know we get super deep into the weeds when we, when we're doing certain things with like analysis, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time today just talking about the test patterns that we would use to set up a TV. So um, number one, um, typically when we set up a TV, we take the generator into the television and adjust our levels on the TV. Now, what on earth are you supposed to do with sources? I've taken this disc, put it in the Blu-ray player, sort out the Blu-ray player, and now the TV and the Blu-ray player are happy with each other. Did you guys have any struggles in the early days looking at some of those early discs and saying, eh, this isn't good enough, we need to make something better? Well, I think one of the things that was never really called out, at least that came along with DVD and Blu-ray, was which color space to use. Mm. In, theory, they, in theory, they should all be the same, but in practice, you know, the display does something, the player does something, and you really got to find out what is the best mode to work with. So, for example, if you're going to hook up a test pattern generator, you should figure out which color space to use first based on your source. Mm -hmm. Then once you figured out your source input, you make sure you're not putting the same color space from the pattern generator. Right, right. So, um, I and we see this all the time, too, where um, you might have a, a really nice Blu-ray player in the mix and, you know, maybe a mid-tier TV uh, or vice versa, and we're trying to figure out... Um, you know, should the TV be doing the decoding? Um, should I be using the color decoder in the TV? And that's really where you need the, the test patterns. And um, if, if those of you out there who are uh, thinking about getting into this or um, uh, looking at like some, um, some high-end calibration gear, uh, this is a great sort of um, taste test, if you will, into, into that world. Because uh, I don't even know, you guys probably know off the top of your head, how many test patterns are probably in the disc set, I mean, I can only imagine how many. Well, when you, you individual ones, I don't know, but overall there's about 5,000 files, video right. files themselves. Yeah, um, and you know, it's Dolby Vision, it's HDR10, HDR10+, HLG, SDR, 709, 2020, different, um, uh, uh, when we talk about HDR, uh, at different, mastered at different NIT levels. So um, I'm finding this now to be a great tool for setting up a TV, but also for figuring out how to set up the rest of the devices in the system. Great example, I've got an Oppo Blu-ray player and a mid-tier TV. I probably want the Oppo to do some of the heavy lifting, but how do I actually test for it? That's where the disc comes in handy. I, th I um, think for us, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I think for us, um, a lot of these patterns come about because we'll see some artifact or we'll see some behavior that we can't quite figure out what's going on and we'll essentially develop patterns to try to figure it out. You know, I mean, a lot of a lot of this just comes from our, you know, looking at a TV, looking at a projector, looking at a player or something like that. And it does something wacky and we're trying to figure out what is the test pattern that's gonna tell us what's going on here. We'll develop a theory, we'll build a pattern, we'll try the pattern, you know, we'll burn a disc or we'll put it on a, a USB stick or something look at the pattern and say, nope, that didn't tell us anything. We try another pattern. And, you know, a lot of that iterative stuff, I mean, we've been doing it now for 20 years where we keep, keep building something, try to build something else. And we sort of feel like at this point, um, if your TV is doing something weird, you can't understand, you know, like somewhere on this disc, there is a pattern that will tell you, at least it will let you go deeper. That'll try to figure out, oh, it happens when I've turned this mode on. When I turn this mode on, this thing happens and I see, you know, this extra moiré, you know, I see a change. I shouldn't mm -hmm. see a change, but I see a change. And this pattern is the one that shows me the biggest difference. And um, usually with that, you know, with that kind of approach, you can figure out, oh, I see when I change color modes, um, some processor is kicking in and it's stepping on the chroma channel or mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not decoding the colors right because all the colors shift and you see that on a pattern. So those are the kinds of things, that, that's how we build these patterns and that's how we think about the patterns. So Don mentioned we test patterns usually like we'll 
you know, I'll create an MP4 and I'll plug it in a USB input on either the player or the television. And so this is one of the issues we ran into during the development of this disc. So with the Oppo, the USB input into the Oppo is slightly different than playing off a disc in the Oppo. Like yep. different pixels are cropped. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful even testing inputs on players because mm -hmm. they might go through a different code path or a right. different yeah, signal path. Now, uh, one thing I wanted to mention, the other day on the forum, someone was talking about in the Oppo, the Dolby Vision mode, they kept it in auto. And I explained that we well, don't want to use auto on that particular case because auto always uses TV, uh, player led Dolby Vision mm -hmm. and player led Dolby Vision is broken on Blu-ray. So you want to use TV led Dolby Vision. So you really always want to force it to TV led. And even if you plug it into a, here's the bad part. If you set it to TV led, plug it into a TV that doesn't support uh, TV led, it'll automatically fall back, but you won't know. Oh yeah. Like yeah. Uh, the, the OG Sony TVs that did Dolby Vision, right? And they, they were only player led on Dolby Vision in that case. Right. Yeah, it's the opposite. Yeah. The other thing where I guess where I was really going with this is a lot of people think they should probably use the auto mode for color space output because mm -hmm. they think, well, auto probably gives me the best quality. The manufacturer knows what they're doing. Well, auto is not right. about the best quality. It's about the fewest support calls. That's what works. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And the RGB 24 is the only mandatory format on uh, HDMI. Mm. So, so the most common denominator. Th this, this is true, I think, of all settings on TV is they, they're set to produce the fewest returns and the fewest support calls you know they just want it they just want it to work out of the box you know it's it's a manufacturing thing i mean we're manufacturers and like on our matrix switches for example they come out of the box with a 1080p eated on all the uh, <laughs> on all the input but but people ask well why would you do that um a mutual friend of ours uh, reached out to me one time and he's like why are the why are the eateds 1080p that's so stupid I'm like because no matter what you plug into it it's going to work and then it's your job as an integrator to manage the eateds to make the system do what you want it to do um but then i guess it's your job as a company to let the let the integrators know they have to do that it's in the quick start guide man just read no the one quick reads guide. guides <laughs> <laughs> so during xbox one development originally yeah. management wanted to buy 50 of the same make and model tvs for everyone in the org to use oh wow and i thought that was crazy so i convinced them to buy everyone a unique make and model and so i built a spreadsheet we Ooh. found several consumer tvs 1080p tvs where the edit was set to 720p sure and so the sure. xbox by default would only output 720p so that convinced them to add the ability to adjust it so yeah um i, I could imagine that you guys uncover problems that the manufacturers didn't even realize like how did um did when you mentioned that story about the oppo did they even know that was a problem or is it something you guys found we found it well by the time we found it they were already shut down oh well too late yeah, yeah. <laughs> now in so when we shipped our very first blu-ray disc uh, I don't think their player had shipped yet, but we had a prototype player and we found some bugs in the player and I'm thinking, oh my God, they'll never be able to fix this. And they fixed it before they shipped. Oh, good. It seemed like such a scary bug that they couldn't fix, but they could. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. The, um, it, do you guys also, I mean, I, I, I feel like at least from my perspective, um, a lot of people who use the disc are, you know, do it yourself or as an enthusiast and, and calibrators. Um, do you guys, do you guys have a lot of, uh, customers who are, who are like the big TV manufacturers who use some of your patterns and stuff? Yes. Yeah. So in fact, in this, for H, for uh, HDR 10 plus, you know, we work directly with HD, the guys at Samsung. Oh, they provided cool. all the tools this time around and checked everything for us. Yeah. Um, and the HDR 10 stuff seems to be growing in popularity. It seems like there, there used to be a super short list of movies and now the list is, it's a nice list now. Um, are you guys, um, when an integrator um, wants to get into calibration, this is a tool that I that I usually recommend to them because it gives them sort of a taste test of what this is all about. Um, the 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 last thing you want to do as an integrator, <clears throat> and unfortunately th this happens too often, but as an integrator, we should be setting basic levels on the TV: black level, white level. Well, I should say this: take it out of energy savings, turn off all the motion stuff, put it in a good mode, set white level, black level, and just do those basic things. But you tell them this and they're like, well, I don't have the signal generator and it's too expensive. And, you know, I've never been to ISF class or PVA class or whatever. And I don't really understand all this stuff. I say, look, guys, grab the disc. Look at these different chapters. Press a button on the remote. Uh, I think the old disc, it was up. Now it's down, right? To see the description. Yeah. So yeah. the reason people that people on their toes. So the reason <laughs> that changed, the reason that changed was when we went to the, the first UHD disc, we didn't have pop-up help, so we used the up arrow to, to, for the configuration, a shortcut to configuration. Okay, okay. So when we came to this disk, we're like, okay, do we move the configuration or do we move the help? So mm. we figured, yeah. well, if you had the last disk, we're going to keep the up arrow for configuration, the down arrow for help. But yes, it's a, it was a problem 
we, 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 realized too late. we use the disc in class um, to say, you know, look, you know, here's here's the player, here's the disc, here's how you put it in, here's what chapter you should go to, here's what you should be looking for on the on the screen, and you know, once people get these like very basic concepts, um, it's kind of you know, the light bulb goes off. And there's a lot of cases where um, someone like this will say, wow, this is really cool. I want to learn more. And then we can start maybe having the conversation about light meters and stuff. But what I really enjoy about the disc is um, there's still a lot of things you can check that you might think you normally need a light meter for, um, such as grayscale test patterns. I and mean, it's very, it's visibly simple. If, if your TV is in like, let's say you're experimenting, trying to pick a good color temperature, you can look some of the grayscale patterns. You know, warm one looks okay, but still maybe a little blue and, and, and warm three looks kind of yellow or, or orange or something. And then all of a sudden, boom, warm two looks, looks pretty neutral. So the, the, the message I'm trying to pass off to people is do your basic adjustments on the TV, but you need something to do that with, go buy yourself one of these discs. So speaking of color temp, have you looked at our new color temp pattern on the new disc? Uh, give me a reminder. It, on the sides, it says D65 plus 1,000 or yeah, plus oh. one. In mm -hmm. plus and minus 1,500 or 1,500? Yeah, it's, so it, you might have 6,500 and then 5,000 and then 8,000. Well, the pattern's not – so when you look at the numbers on the side, it's not showing what absolute range is. Basically, you, what, the way the pattern is designed to work, because it looks backwards to most people, mm -hmm. with it being warm on top and cool on the bottom, even though oh, it says sure. 1,500 on the bottom, is you simply find the row – preferably using an optical comparator or some kind of reference that looks the closest to D65, then you look at the number on the side that tells you how far away you are from D65 and which direction to go. Ah, okay. I got it. That's cool. Yeah, I did. I did see that one. And there's a, there's a few other uh, patterns in there too, that I noticed the, um, it looks like the bias light pattern is a new one. It was on, sorry, it was on the second edition. It's just, it was never part of the video setup screen. Ah, okay. That's why so it's we, hard to find. We moved it there since it, yeah. So people like, it was typically under, I think, advanced video before. Yeah, and it's it's nice and it's easy to use. My actually, I have a question for for you guys as someone who uses it. Um, the uh, when you're when you're making your bias light measurement, um, are people just kind of eyeballing that, or are they using something to adjust the bias light to the test pattern? It's uh, so uh, both. You know, both. <laughs> I mean, the idea it was with the pattern. You can kind of eyeball it. I mean, you certainly can get in the right ballpark. Not too bright. Not too dim. You know, if it if the back wall you're seeing or whatever your the bias light is reflecting off of looks basically the same brightness as what's on the screen, you're in the right, you know, you're in the right range. It, on on my TV, um, it's a 65 C8 LG OLED, so a few years old now, but still looks cool and still works fine. Um, I have a bias light behind it, one of Jason's lights, and um, I ended up setting it to 10%, um, and then I still knocked it down like one or two clicks. So it's not very bright at all, but watching it in a dark room, it just it makes things easier to look at, and it's not like blaring back there. But other than just guessing of what it's supposed to be without any education or knowledge of what it's supposed to be, you look at the test pattern, adjust the bias light, as Don just said, make it make them look the same as close as you can, and boom, you're done. No, no tools needed except for the disc. So I think I drive Jason crazy because I always use the PC monitor single strip bias light on my TVs. Oh, boy, yeah, he probably... <laughs> But it's not as bright as the other one, so I have to do a lot far fewer adjustments. So I have the I have the single one on my OLED that's in my office, uh, and then I have the all the way around one on right. the TV on the TV at home. But um, I'll tell you, man, like the bias lights are always a fun conversation. And I did a podcast with Jason; we got really deep into it. And um, I was a little worried that the bias light would kind of kill some of the effect of the OLED being perfect black, and I think it actually helped it. Um, I was worried that there would be some disconnect between the the TV itself and the and the black wall behind it. But I personally think after I started playing with it, um, I, I was I was wrong, and it actually did give the image more depth. And it almost looked like it almost in a weird way, it almost looked like the TV was like closer to me. So you mentioned Avia earlier. Well, Guy Quo, the author of that, he uses a, or at least back in the day, he used a bias light on a projection screen. Oh, interesting. To improve the, the perceived contrast ratio. Yeah. So I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, it works with anything. I mean, yeah. it's. Uh, sure. You just, just, I mean, thank a projection screen given that they're attached to a wall usually. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people who work in mastering studios, they've got, you know, they've got dim lights. They've either got a bias light or they've got, you know, just small amounts of lighting. And that's by design, you know, not just from the control panels and stuff. They just, the feeling is that the, 
you know, the picture looks better with a little bit of bias lighting. Um, there was a question that came in already. Um, let's see, this might take a second to read because he's, he's typed in a couple here. Uh, some OLED TVs add dither to the original signal to help the panel with the reproduction of near black stuff. Are there any tests on the disk to determine how much dither the TV has added and how bad the dither problem might be? Oh, I think all OLEDs use dither, but he's yeah. probably talking about specifically LGs to compensate for that sort of overshoot coming out of black. Mm -hmm. That happens. Um, I'm going to say no. Yeah. <laughs> Not a pattern to detect that. Don, you may have other ideas. Yeah, I mean... Uh, aren't they using a temporal dither? They're, yeah, so temporal dither is usually visible, right? Yeah, so spatial dither is usually pretty hard to see, if not impossible. Mm -hmm. Whereas temporal dither is where you, you tend to see it, because DLPs yeah. used it as well. I oh, mean, yeah. if it's sort of like if everything's working right, I mean, you could use um, what's the pattern that was intended to show the flickering? Did we did we put that on the disk or did we? We did. It's we, on disk two. It's there's only two test patterns on disk two, and it's. Mm -hmm. uh, Near black overdrive, I think it's called. Yeah, right. So you could use the near black overdrive and look for kind of sparkly, speckly things happening. Um, yeah, that that test is specifically designed to just move between black and very low numbers in different channels. You know, it, it moves back and forth between, you know, like just, a, just black and near black, you know, constantly moving between black and near black at different levels, different um, different channels, single channels, two channels, all three channels. And uh, depending on the specific way the OLED is configured, you can see flickering, sparkling, things like that. It's, it's, it's very subtle. You want your eyes to be fully adapted mm -hmm. and you know, it may or may not be as visible. Like we, we have had people point it out, like they can see it on a specific OLED and we can see it on a specific OLED, but the test pattern, I don't know. I think it, it it's, it's very tough to see. And um, there's probably more iterations that could be done to make, uh, to, to look for that particular artifact. And, but and so the, the pattern... thing is they, they get better at it. I mean, you know, LG took that pattern and use sure. it tweak their their um, dithering to try to make it you know so the, the pattern does two things is so it starts off with the uh, it basically flickers on and off about every four or five seconds the idea was to turn all the pixels off turn them on and to look for that overshoot that flicker but then mm -hmm. after it does that then it will pan left and right and mm -hmm. that panning actually uh, on some displays you'll actually see the streaking from it that's another side effect of it which is what Vincent Teal likes to use it for so he's using it for oh, yeah. An unintended purpose, which I think it probably works much better for. Yeah, that's now, cool. Our brightness pattern has a, a checkerboard in the background, and I'm going to mm -hmm. use 8-bit code values just because it's easier. So the checkerboard is made up of 16 and 17 code values. It's really 64 and 67 or 68, yeah. whatever it is. But um, that was designed specifically for DLPs and dither. The idea was you would have dither in the 16 box and no dither in the 17 box. Mm. And at that, at that point, black level was set correctly. Yeah, and and you can definitely say that on some DLPs and on other yeah. DLPs is very very subtle. It it's it's a very revealing test. Right. Well, yeah, it was it was I think originally modeled after did uh, D Cinema DLPs, and even the Samsung DLP that Joe Kane worked on, it works perfectly on that. I had a uh, I had a uh, Samsung uh, five zero eight six DLP. It was like my first. I went from I had a um, from Sound Advice when I worked there. I had a thirty six inch Trinitron. And then um, I rocked that TV for like years and then uh, eventually gave it to my dad. And then my Samsung DLP was like my very first, you know, high definition 16 by nine TV. And you guys probably remember those early ones, but everything is DLP. So, you know, everything was done in the service menu with calculations and stuff. <laughs> um, you could not turn off the overscan. Um, mm. It just, it, it, but at the time, you know, I, I had a, a big pioneer Blu-ray player. It was about that tall. BDP 51, <laughs> I think was the model number. And man, mm. putting in Planet Earth, like this is what, 2000, like maybe six or seven. Oh my God. It was like, you know, it was the greatest thing ever. And at the time, you guys are really, really think this is funny. I was, uh, I was attempting uh, this whole bias light thing. And uh, I didn't know back then nearly, nearly as much now. I certainly didn't have the tools to, to make sure it was right. But 
back in those days, I was like, I'm going to go to Home Depot and get a 6,500K light bulb and put it in a housing and clamp it to the back and shoot it to the back of the wall. And, um, you know, most of my friends that came over, they're like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. But looking back on it now, it's like cringy. I was like, oh, my God, that was just like the worst possible way to do it. But but it was it was still cool. But, you know, the, these things are just so much more accessible now and, and so much more affordable. I mean, you can um, you can you can. Jason's lights are awesome and they're, they're, they're not expensive and you mm. don't have to worry about a fluorescent bulb or fluorescent tube back there. You just get the length you need and slap it on the back of the TV and, and you're fine. Now, so, I still have one of those ideal loom fluorescent tubes mounted to the wall behind this monitor. It's, it's unplugged, oh, but it's back there. Yeah, yeah. You, you probably don't use it, but it's back there. <laughs> well, it actually makes a great light for other things as well. If oh, I'm there you go. I'm trying to work back there hooking up wires and stuff, I turn it on. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty cool to me that, you know, uh, we're getting CRI numbers on on his stuff or 98, 99. And it's, I, I tell people all the time, like you you can't just, like what I did when I was young, you can't just buy a bulb because, I mean, you can, this obviously be a fun experiment, but you can go to Home Depot and buy nine 6,500 Kelvin bulbs and one's yellow and one's, you know, one's kind of pink and one's one sort of whatever. Well, right. just like just like yesterday when we were talking about um, uh, displays and their, their spectrum, what they mm -hmm. look like and how spiky they oh, are. Well, yeah. it's the same thing with LED bulbs. Right. Oh, yeah. Now, even the even the supposedly high CRI bulbs, if you look at their spectra, they're pretty spiky. Mm -hmm. um, the CRI is measured by um, basically illuminating a, a bunch of test, you know, um, chips mm -hmm. and <laughs> measuring them with a spectral radiometer and making sure that, you know, the test colors, which represent, a, you know, a range of important colors and some yep. dyes that are susceptible to metamerism. Um, so, you know, it any color that's not in their test suite is not necessarily going to come out right. So even something that's 98, 99 may still mm -hmm. have here and there, you could get a color that'll look one way under sunlight and another gotcha. way under the light. Gotcha. But, you know, I mean, they, the, the, it's a good system. Like the People who do color stuff professionally, like they rely on high CRI, LED, and fluorescent lights. You know, people who mm -hmm. work in textiles, you know, fashion companies and stuff, they're okay. constantly working under interior lights. And mm -hmm. high CRI lights have, have proved themselves in real world, like, uses. So, and with a bias light, really, it's just the interaction of that light with the paint on your wall, you know, sure. or whatever is behind, whatever backing, wallpaper, paint, or whatever. So uh, a neutral paint is going to have very low uh, interaction, I would say, with the with the bias light. So it should be under. I don't know why I went off on this. I, I, there was a point that I <laughs> well, had when a, I started this. So it, there's actually a new standard, and I think Jason's been using it as well, which the cinema industry came up with when LED lights came out for cinema use, because everyone had used like Kino flows, which were fluorescent, or actual mm. real, you know, real lights. But since everyone's going to uh, LEDs, they needed a new system. And so mm. I believe Jason's been using that. I forget the name of it offhand. Yeah. Mm. Um, you, you had mentioned the, the black level pattern before with the code values. And this is another great uh, use case for, for the disk. Um, even in our own Meridio, in the 6G generator, um, in the, the version of it right now, we don't have a 10-bit black level pattern. So we're still, a lot of people are still relying on, you know, 16 versus 17 versus 18. And um, the first time I saw your 10-bit pattern was at one of the shootouts. And, you know, sure enough, we're looking at, you know, 64, 65, 66, just so much more granularity. So uh, if, if you're out there and you, and you are calibrating 10-bit systems, um, you got to have, you got to have the disc to get the proper black level. If, if you're just looking at 16 or 17, you might way overshoot it or way undershoot it because you're not looking at it at that much detail. So thanks for doing that. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, at the top and bottom of the pattern, we put that small gradient, which goes yeah. slightly, I think, is it code value 100 down to 64, I think? I forget. Yeah. Or maybe you can go below black on the SDR version. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. And then that one, um, maybe I'm not remembering right, that one that one flashes too, right? Or is that one static? I can't remember. That one, the brightness pattern is static. The dynamic range low flashes. Oh, the low, dynamic range yeah. low flashes. Cool. Um, yeah, that okay. one gives you the, the actual larger size steps plus a gradient in the middle versus the pluge pattern, which has the, you know, 2%, 4% below and above plus mm -hmm. a small gradient at the top and bottom and the checkerboard in the background. Um, there's another tool in here. Um, it's part of the part of the demo material. And um, th this is going to help me immensely. And I, and I wanted to bring it up because as I started thinking about it, I'm like, man, there's so many use cases for this. 
So uh, on the disc, when you're looking at some of the clips from the montage, um, it, it sort of uh, cuts the image in half and then starts to sort of spin around. Oh. So you can see what's HDR versus SDR. So when we're doing our like ISF classes, for example, you know, we're, we're trying to think of all these ways to show people SDR versus HDR. We're like, okay, maybe we'll just get two of the same TV and use a, use a, a splitter and do something with, uh, with eat it and just somehow sort of figure this out. And it was always just real kludgy. Uh, but now you can just look at one of those scenes and watch the thing spin around and maybe even hit pause somewhere and say, look at the red here versus here, or green here versus. So I'm thinking about this and I'm like, man, if I were a retailer, and trying to convince people that they should look at better TVs with higher nit values and all this other stuff, I would be using that thing all the time. So good job on that. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah. The whole spiral. I think we called it a spiral. I think Joel Silver called it a pinwheel, which is a good name too. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. I like well, that. Makes it because before I think we just done a split screen, and mm -hmm. so you're not actually looking at the same pieces on both you sides. The whole thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Unless you butterfly it or something. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was that was really cool. And then um, one thing that I saw that was new, and I think I've got I think I've got this right. But please correct me. There's also a section in there where you can look at the the content graded versus ungraded. So is yeah. that raw camera footage versus after it was? Colored? Yeah, so that that's the footage as the colorist saw in Resolve when he first loaded it up before mm -hmm. he made any adjustments. And so I, we rendered that out, and then we rendered out the grade, and we just you know did this the uh, pinwheel on them as well. Which I and you also see some shots that have visual effects. Where like the sun disappears in one shot because it was added in post. Oh sure, sure. There's two other sun shots where they clipped in camera, and those were redone by VFX as well. Yeah, um, that's pretty cool because you know I, when I'm teaching people about this stuff, it, it's really fun to say. Um, it a lot of people, I feel like don't grasp the importance and how much work a, a colorist does. Exactly. So <laughs> when you um, and, and we talk about artist intent and all this other stuff, but. I think a lot of people don't realize like how many people get their eyes and hands on that piece of content before it actually uh, hits hits our eyeballs at home. So just I think that really gives people perspective on how much work goes into this because then you're looking at the grading and then you're looking at the HDR or Adobe Vision portion of it and you start to really realize like you know I think people think that you just shoot a movie and then show it on a TV and that's <laughs> that's kind of the end of it. But you guys have put some really cool tools in there to show people that um, here's what the content looks like here's what it's supposed to look like so that's, that's yeah really and so, I mean, no, no bad. okay i'll go first um so yeah like you said i wanted to, to showcase what a colorist actually does and the amount of work oh, they good. do because there were a lot of shots that weren't even white balanced and because the camera shoots raw it just shows you the power of raw and what you can fix in post and change mm -hmm. i mean even before i mean obviously in digital video now they can do all kinds of stuff um, and colorists have more tools, but even in analog film, you know, color timing was a big part of that whole, and it was called color timing because it's kind of like, how long does it spend in each of the developer stages? So they could, mm. by fiddling with the chemistry, they could take a shot and punch up the reds, punch up the, you know, punch up different colors. Mm -hmm. They could change the contrast. They could do a bunch of stuff. And that was all analog with chemistry. Yeah. And it was a big part of, you know, getting the finished look of the film, you know, it, like, and that's the thing that I think people who haven't worked in film don't understand is that what you see on the screen is not what the people standing there during the shoot saw. I mean, yes, you see the same people and the same sets and stuff, yeah. but it's radically different. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, that's one of the trickiest things. One of the trickiest technical things in film is you're looking at the set that is super brightly lit sometimes that has all this, you know, it just looks a particular way and you've got to imagine what it's going to look like by the time it's been post-processed and color timed and everything. Uh, I was once on a film set where they were shooting like a smoky, dimly lit bar and they were shooting on film and because of the stock and because of the aperture they had to use they had to light this thing up it looked like oh, it man. was you know like it was broad, broad daylight you know they had <laughs> huge huge lights it was extremely hot and, they had, and the place was filled with smoke real smoke because in those days you could just you could just have people act and surrounded by smoke they actually had smudge pots and they're like oh geez spreading smoke all over the place that's funny. and it looked it did not look good at all. And then right. I got to see the dailies a few hours later and it looked beautiful. It was yeah. beautiful. The shadows were fantastic. It looked like a totally different space. And it was like, you know, they just had to like hold up smoked glass and kind of go, yeah, what's this going to look like when we stop it down, mm -hmm. you know, 
so three stops or something and it's it's anyway it's crazy so to don's point about how they would develop film um so uh color front transcoder is the product we use to process the montage and their cto bill feitner was directly involved in this well bill when he was at eFilm, he co-founded eFilm, he came up with a technique where even with the cans of film, he'd know how, how long the first can of film was shot and when they dipped it, and he would not expose the last can of film used on that movie until it had been sitting as long as the first can of film. Oh, yeah. Just to make sure everything exposed more evenly. That's that's interesting. It's almost like, um, it, it's almost analogous to like, um, you know, when people like in commercial, like uh, we just had, we just met somebody who works at Universal Studios who came to one of the classes and, and he was telling the story about how um, they have these, and, and for some of the rides, they have these like modular video walls. And um, it, this is what reminded me of it is is you can't like, in the back where all the stuff is stored, there's like a bin of tiles from March. <laughs> and there's another bin of tiles that were made in September. And if you look at the two next to each other, they're not the same. So the fact they were taking that extra length to make sure even the film was aged in the same way, yeah. you know, that just shows you how, 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 how how seriously people take this stuff and i man i at the end of the day man to me this is all art and and i want to honor the art and i want to respect the art and and i want to see what they envisioned and, and that's the, the whole point of what we do and it just kind of just breaks my heart when people are have their tvs in vivid mode and you know yeah. all the motion stuff is turned on and you're just, but it, you guys can probably um I feel like when we first started, when I first started calibrating, it was, I got the tail end of CRT, thankfully it was a tail end, um, but into plasma DLP and the others. Um, I feel like in those days, it was like, um, just do your best, right? It was like, even a pioneer, you know, it had one color management control and it was a hue control. So you just couldn't, it had some controls, you still couldn't get them right. And it was just, it was kind of a nightmare. And you know, fast forward to even just a few years ago, and now these consumer TVs are dialing in easily, and they have a lot of controls, and most of them work. So it has to be really interesting from your guys' perspective because you do work kind of more on the production side to see how much better the consumer TVs have gotten. It feels it, feel, it feels like that would be a, a huge thing for Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood uses the OLEDs for their client monitors, right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it's funny yeah. you mentioned the, a Pioneer CRT. So. Bob McJimsey or Robert McJimsey was an early calibrator, mm -hmm. and he came in the the Pioneer rear projection Elite TV and the you know with the uh, piano lacquer black. Is that the one with the nine inch guns that they would always. Yeah, so its color decoder was off, but he would come over and he had, with a scope he'd put a potentiometer potentiometer on, adjust it to figure out what the right value should be, and he'd replace the resistor and he'd correct ah. the color decoder as part of the calibration. Wow, that's yeah, and and that's like taking the TV apart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I once made a mistake. I had a rear projection television, and I'm like, you know, what? I want to fix convergence. So I zeroed out all the convergence controls. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> that took. I turned cold and you know sweaty and nervous, and it was my TV, but still, it was. Uh, it took a oh, while to get man. it back to where it was. I I broke that one. That was a hard one lesson. Time. They. Um, well, those those of us who oh no go ahead. I I was just it, it was a funny story. I I went to someone's house one time and they originally called me because uh, the colors were funny on their TV and uh, they just assumed it was a as a it was a settings issue or calibration issue. So I go out there and it was a Mitsubishi non diamond series, just like your your kind of base model Mitsubishi. And um, um, I noticed immediately that the convergence was off. But on that specific TV, they had an auto converge button on the front panel, and I <laughs> I hit that button and all of a sudden poof. I was like, uh oh, I think I just broke this lady's TV. It wouldn't turn back on. Now the power light was blinking. I was like, oops. I'm like, why'd they put the button there if it was going to blow the TV <laughs> up? It was, nah, it was just funny. But mm. hey, sorry, Don. I... No, no. It's, I was saying that, I mean, back in the day when you had, you know, like rear projection or front projection, three CRT TVs, and you had convergence and focus and all these things. You know, calibration could really make a massive difference, you know, just crazy differences where it, it, it was like, you know, I had the first expensive, fairly expensive for me. I was a young, you know, newly married guy. I I uh, I bought this Toshiba, you know, it was like their, mm. their small 40 inch uh, rear projector, you know, in a box. And um, I got a guy out to calibrate it and man, he got the focus, he got the convergence. All right. He got all, he got the grayscale. And like, for me, it was amazing. This TV suddenly looked beautiful and sure. before it, it looked pretty decent. And I think well, modern TVs, obviously there are mode switches that if you leave them on, things are 
really bad and just sure. turning those off can make a huge difference or you know, sure. switching it into an appropriate mode but in one sense it's like yeah you put one of these tvs in cinema or whatever their mode you know filmmaker mode or whatever they've labeled as their most calibrated mode and often it's pretty decent you know All and there's no more times. convergence issues to deal with there's no more sure. focus issues to deal with if it's on a projector and uh, that's great but um there's still issues out there that if you're really you know nitpicky and you want the absolute best picture possible mm -hmm. you know there's still stuff to look at there's still stuff that to worry about and um and and every it seems like every year we see another manufacturer come up with a new way to mess up the oh, yeah. picture <laughs> a new way to mess it up i like that <laughs> <laughs> well they're they're all trying to both reach the aficionados with a kind of a out of the box, reasonably calibrated experience, mm -hmm. but that's not their primary market. No, the primary market, market is the person who goes to Costco and just walks down little rows of TVs and goes, "Oh, that, like that one's really good." <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and I guarantee you, all those TVs are in like vivid mode. They're in like torch sure. mode, just you know, Absolutely. and they're running their demo material that is designed to pop like mm -hmm. crazy. And, yeah. So maybe you know, someone should pitch to these big box stores. Hey, you know, if you put them all in the right modes, your electricity will go down and you'll save money. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's so funny because I mean I almost feel like it's um, I don't feel like it it is deceiving so you go to a big box store you've got hand-picked content by whatever manufacturer it's in vivid mode it, it, all these things have been manipulated and then somebody gets that same TV home and in the setup menu they pick home instead of store because they're at home so it doesn't go into blast mode it goes into energy savings mode and then they look at their cable box and they're like, this is not what I just saw at Costco or Best Buy or whatever half an hour ago. Like, what, what's going on here? And what I'm finding right now that's funny, two things. Um, too many people assume just because the TV is expensive, it should be perfect. And I, so many times we deal with the highest end of the highest end TVs uh, on the consumer side, at least. And a lot of us will still stand back and go, you know what? It turned out pretty good, but it's still didn't do great with this or this. It did really good with this, but not so much this. Um, so, so we have this like disconnect between cost and and what the TV is capable of. But I always have to tell people, guys, LG, Samsung, whoever, they don't know your room. They don't know what you're hooking up to it. You got to get in there and 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 make some proper adjustments for that system in, in that room. And that's kind of been the point this whole time. And Something I've noticed is, you know, a lot of the a lot of the young guys who are running the YouTube channels and, and doing reviews, um, I feel like what we do uh, as far as even just basic setup with a disc or calibrating or whatever, I feel like there's more exposure to this stuff now than there ever has been. Would you guys agree to that? Yeah. Yes. For um, people that are aficionados, there's so much more information out there now than there was 20 years ago. I mean, the internet is just filled with all sorts of free information. Some of it very good, some of it, as you know, <laughs> uh -huh. you know. Less good. And that's the yeah, problem, you don't good. know who's good and who's bad, yeah. so. Any, anyone right. can start up a YouTube channel, so. Yeah. That's right. And the quality of YouTube's gotten really impressive, so. <laughs> yeah, but actually, that's, that brings up a good point. Um, uh, another good reason to have the disc is is um, the, the last thing, I, man, I'm, I'm, I harp on this so much. The last thing you want to do is, you know, you're as a calibrator or an integrator, you, you set the TV up for somebody and you don't have anything good to show them. Like, okay, mm -hmm. I just did all this extra work and spent, whether it's 15 minutes doing basic front panel controls or an hour, two hours, three hours to really nail it. And then you realize like, oh my God, this poor customer has like no good content. <laughs> you know, so, so you end up like showing them what the potential of the system is. And all of a sudden the light bulb goes off and they go, you know, maybe I should upgrade my Netflix account to 4K. Maybe I should start buying 4K disc. Maybe I should start doing this. So um, using these test patterns on the disc or whatever, you show people the potential of what the system's capable of, and all of a sudden they go, okay, maybe I do need to take this a little bit more seriously. I mean, you buy a $2,000 TV and you're not happy with it. I mean, that's that's no fun. I mean, it's really true that HDR, um, the, the studios have been very conservative with their use of HDR for a yeah. variety of reasons. You know, it, it's still a little bit, like there's so many different TVs and they all have different tone mapping algorithms. And the only thing that they can mostly count on being the same, and, and Stacy can tell you there are even issues with this, is that, mm -hmm. you know, Dolby Vision should be consistent across displays and so forth. Sure. But 
not always and the, the physical amount of nits that a particular tv can put out and so forth varies so the studios they like having hdr but they tend to you know pull it in and and really not make heavy use of it so you've got this tv with huge capabilities but um there's very little content that really exercises and shows what it's mm. capable of and you know like we designed i should say stacy designed um the you know the demo material on this disc to really push the envelope you really go all the way out and you can really see what the maximum what the full potential of hdr is because there are some shots in that montage that go all the way out to 10,000 nits obviously there is no device currently that can go that high but i mean it's pushing it to the absolute limit of what the format can do so you know, I mean, if you want to see what does it look like when my screen goes completely bright yeah. on some of the brighter models today, you you may want sunglasses handy. You know, <laughs> yeah. when those things get really bright, sure. they're very bright, you know. Yeah. Like, so they... I'll say that no one who's watched the montage today in, in the consumer space has actually seen what it looks like because there's no TV oh, out there sure. on the planet today that shows oh, it as it was meant to be done. For right. example, the opening the opening fade up. Mm -hmm. That actually has veiling glare. So if you uh, were to cover the top half of the screen, you'll actually see more detail on the bottom. No consumer uh -huh. TV does that, but the grading monitor did that. So you would mm -hmm. hold a paper and you're like, wow, look at all that detail. Take it, take the, uh, the folder away and it was all gone because your oh, eyes man. are blinded by the veiling glare. Yeah, the grading monitor goes to 4,000 nits mm -hmm. and they showed us some demo material that they made uh, at Dolby and uh, it was amazing. Like a guy comes out of a cave and out into the desert and oh. everybody in the room, like reflexively, is doing <laughs> like, oh my god! You it's know, like going from my dark it, office to my Florida outdoor summer sun. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, you know, at one point he like looks up at the sun, and again, everybody in the, is like, whoa, yeah. hey, hey, hang on here. Right. But when what he went outside, it was dry because it was a desert. You go outside, you get soaking wet from the humidity. Oh, my God. Especially <laughs> right now. We've had so much rain in the past few days. It, I mean, it, even a Florida boy grown and you know, born and raised here, I'm still going outside in the past couple of days. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's rough. The, the One of the tools I wanted to mention, um, or, or at least a, um, uh, something that interesting is interesting for people to see, I think. Uh, another thing we struggle with in class, and this is also might be good for somebody who's maybe a retailer trying to show off the importance of this stuff. Um, we're always trying to find interesting ways to show people like, you know, we're looking at a piece of content and um, who shot the who shot the scene with the red tulips and the one yellow tulip? That was Tyler and myself. Was that Tyler? That's such a great shot. And Tyler, well, Tyler pointed and said, hey, because we're just shooting the red field. And he's like, hey, there's a yellow tulip by itself. So we pointed ah, it that way. just happened to work out well. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's. And, and so that's a good example because in SDR, that uh, tulip begins to lose color. The yellow turns white. Yeah, and, and you can't maintain that that saturation of color at that brightness. You, you guys have on the new disc, you have that um, that kind of histogram that'll show you. And this is what we struggle with in classes. You know, it's easy to show somebody a Rec 709 triangle and a Rec 2020 triangle, and you know, there's like uh, some stained glass windows. So there's some colors in there that are outside of 709. And you're looking at just like a graph, and it's kind of boring. But on that disc, man, you can show people that you know this particular scene this part of this scene does go up to maybe 10,000 nits and this particular color of this thing over here does go outside of 709 does go outside of p3 so it's 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 making things easier for for me especially to really be able to just look at something and recognize oh that's p3 red or that's you know that's 709 red or, or whatever so you're I, I'm getting to a point now where my eyes are starting to agree with the data the, the data being what you're seeing on the disk and you know, people see that stuff and it's like, oh, wow, it could be this much more. I should buy a better TV. So it's, I, I think it's a, a helpful tool too. When you look so that's that the way. HDR getting, analyzer montage. Yeah. Yep. Getting back to what you were saying before about comparing HDR to SDR, I think that's, that's really true. If you show somebody an HDR image by itself, uh, something about the visual system, it doesn't always register. Maybe when there's something like super bright and super dark, you know, at the same time, mm -hmm. you might say, oh, wow, I see that. But a lot of times you can take something where it's, you know, it's going all the way up to a thousand nits and people just say, it looks like a nice picture. But if yeah. you could show them the SDR version of exactly the same thing, they'd go, oh, oh. my goodness, wow. <laughs> yeah. I remember when the first demo, Stacy, we went out to... Um, that was at SpectraCal. A Spectre cow. Yeah. yeah, and they had uh, a fairly new um, HDR, and I had we that had two point, Vizio displays, yeah, side by side. Yeah, mm -hmm. 
I don't think I had seen um I don't think I'd seen HDR yet at that point. And with and they were showing uh, Man of Steel, I think. And there's like a shot where there's this these bright flashes, you know, it's like near the end of the film and it's a very blue cast. And on the SDR, it basically the whole screen just whited out every time there was a kind flash. Gray. And on the yeah. HDR, like you could see what was going on, it got brighter. Mm -hmm. And it sort of illuminated the whole set, you know, and you're like, wow, there's stuff going on that I literally can't see in the SDR because it's just, you know, it's just too bright. And to try to get across this, you know, big sort of almost lightning flash of light, they've just practically whited out the screen. And on the HDR, everything just gets very bright for a second. And then, mm -hmm. and it was, it, it was amazing to see the difference. Not to mention that, of course, the HDR, screen was just fundamentally brighter and just looked because of those big brightness differences it increases absolute contrast so and contrast is one of the key factors of uh, you know of sharpness so oh, sure. it looks sharper it mm -hmm. looks it pops more it looks more saturated it's yeah. you know i mean like everything gets better but it's very hard to see without a side-by-side -side comparison it's really hard and and the same thing is true with UHD and HD, or H, frankly, honestly, for lots of people, between HD and SD, which oh, is man. astonishing. That was, yeah. I mean, I'll show somebody, like, I remember when Blu-rays came out, and I would show somebody a movie that we knew well on HD, and they'd be like, I don't know, is this different from the DVD? And I would, like, pop in the DVD, and by the time the DVD gets up and running and I get to that same scene, they're like, I don't know, it doesn't seem any different. If you can put it up side by side on two yeah. monitors, and everybody can see it. Anyone yeah. can look and go, oh my God, wow, it's radically different. Yeah. But with a little bit of time and just your memory of what the scene looked like, it's very hard. And sure. it's one of the tough things about trying to sell people on better video is when you look at it in isolation, you're just like, I feel like I've seen video this good before. But yeah, uh, you know, you haven't really. Uh -huh. I, I have a fun question, and then I know I know you guys are running low on time, so I, Stacey, I, I don't want to I didn't mean to interrupt you. What were you going to say? Oh, I was going to talk more about the demo what we did. So basically, we had two oh, Vizio yeah. reference displays, mm -hmm. and Tyler and I set up the demo. We made sure the SDR display was calibrated with an external LUT box, so you got proper 709 color. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was we showed HDR first. You always mm -hmm. want to demo HDR first and then put HDR and SDR on at the same time. It's a top-down selling. Yes. <laughs> well, no, because if you show SDR, then HDR, people, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's uh, fun. I've got um, uh, I've got uh, one question for you guys, and then uh, we've got a few questions in the question box. And this is just kind of a fun one for me. So imagine you got a time machine, and you take uh, the latest uh, latest and greatest TV from any manufacturer, and let's say this is a two thousand dollar TV. Uh, take that TV back to uh, two thousand ten, and hypothetically look at that versus the best plasma right before the plasmas went out, went, went, went down the drain. I've said this before. If I had seen a TV like what we have now that anyone can go buy back then, I would have for sure thought that this was some $100,000, you know, like crazy, crazy well, expensive thing. Back then that thing. TV would have been $100,000. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 or a million dollars. So, so um, probably we could only see it at like Kodak or something. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, Caleb Dennison from Digital Trends just did a really cool video. It's one of those I wish I'd thought of it kind of things, but he did a, a high-end Samsung Plasma versus the high-end TE today and did a comparison video between the two. And we're looking at the Plasma, we're like, oh my God, we liked that? Like it was, <laughs> that, was that was fun. Um, okay, let me hit the question well, everyone box everyone loved here. their Curo display, right? Their What's that? Pioneer, their Pioneer Curo that they seem to love. Oh, yeah. Over. Yeah, and now you look at one now. There's actually one at a restaurant that I frequent down here in downtown St. Pete that just it looks terrible. But um, okay, so a question, couple questions that came in. Um, uh, well, I was hey, I was just in your neighborhood a few weeks ago. I was in St. Uh, Pete. I, yeah, I went to the Sunken Gardens. Oh, it's I, it's I, it's right down the street. That's yeah, awesome. I live downtown. That's cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so one question. Um, are there any resellers in Europe to get the newest disc I'd like to purchase from them to speed thing up and avoid customs? Yes. Uh, email us or contact us on our website, and I'll forward you to Jason, who will then tell you who the dealers are in Europe. Okay. I know there's a dealer in France and a couple other places. I don't remember all the countries. But okay. Jason handles all the distribution, so. Awesome. Um I've seen a teaser of the disc where the white, where there's a white circle in the middle displayed against a moving and changing background. Mm -hmm. uh, this was supposed to determine real HDR luminance stability. 
was this test included on the new disc? If not, which test would you recommend to measure peak HDR luminance stability? So the pattern is called peak luminance and it is on the disc. Cool, easy one. Um, next one, I actually like this question. This is a great question from Tom. Um, what was the most difficult test pattern to make on the new disc or which test pattern are you especially proud of? That's a good question. Difficult to make in what context? I mean, the, the color space <laughs> eval pattern, while it's not new to this disc, it is certainly the probably the most amount of code and it keeps growing with each each version of the disc. That was a, quite a, yeah, each time we make the disc, we add more things to the color space evaluation pattern and we have to find a place to put it. You know, like it's <laughs> like we got to redesign the whole thing and then it was like, well, we got to add this other thing. It's a yeah. key thing. Um, <laughs> And if I, make, if I make changes, I'm a little more sloppy in the way I do my calculations. And Don will yeah. spend a whole bunch of time rewriting that before he moves on to the next piece. Oh, yeah. Actually, yeah. Doing the actual change I want. So. Why you guys yeah. make such a great team. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but but there was one time where Don was complaining about the code, and I'm like, uh, you wrote that. <laughs> that was you, dude. That wasn't me. Right back. Yes. Yeah, that's a bad feeling when you look at this code and like, oh, my God, Stacy is so terrible. What is he doing here? This, And then I realize, oh, I wait, I wrote this it. code. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it happens. I'm sorry to say. Um, that's, a, that's okay. Um, uh, in case of, okay, so this question is about, um, have, I think it's about having the files of some of the test patterns on, on a drive. He says, uh, would it be possible for registered or verified users to download some of the tests without perhaps having to have the disk? The problem is it's a lot of work to make those files. So on the disk, every static pattern is nine frames long. And it took three months of machine time just to encode all the content on those disks. Oh, holy so if, if you wanted it on a USB stick, for example, it needs to be longer. And I usually recommend uh, one minute, which is 1,440 frames. So it just takes longer to encode. And it takes more drive space to render the source file out, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So and it then can't we, be done, it's just time. And <clears throat> you'd like to think that you could just make a sort of standard MPEG file, but it turns out that every different decoder is a little bit different. Like. Yeah. Um, Blu-ray, for all of its flaws and issues, UHD Blu-ray, they really did lock down the specs in a way that, you know, it, it's it's this thing that millions of people own, you know, tens of millions of people own, that is pretty locked down as far as specs. Mm -hmm. But you start talking about individual files, well, we could make a file, it is entirely possible that we could make a file where we're happy with the results on an LG, but it doesn't work right on a Sony. And then we got to re-encode it and figure out how it works on the Sony. And then we find it only works on like the last two years of Sony. And the previous Sonys, they need a slightly different encode oh, yeah, with different cool flags. And then we find out that Samsung is just a little bit different or that <laughs> it works, but the quality is not what we would expect. And then we got to, you know, for each of these things, we got to target the the files you'd think oh but I just want this one file it's not that easy I, I think for certain so, patterns we could maybe just make a generic file and put it up there and let use your own risk yeah so yeah. Um, on the previous disc every pattern was one frame long we went to NAB and while we were at NAB David the person who authored the disc happened to test it on a Samsung player in Sonaris booth and it wouldn't play mm. none of the static patterns would play so basically we had to re-encode every static pattern on the last disc about four weeks before the disc launched to make them two uh, frames long. Jeez. And so I this time this around, we a, made them all nine, so. <laughs> I think it's a really interesting thing why they're nine frames long. We realized, um, well, Stacy realized that, you know, if you just make one frame long, it's an I frame. I don't know if you know about MPEG's encoding system, but there's I, B, and P frames where yeah. the I frame is an independent frame. So it's just like a JPEG file. You know, like it's a one frame. Just one thing, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's basically JPEG and compressed. It's almost identical. It's a little bit different, but it's pretty close. And then the P frame say, okay, from the previous decoded frame, yeah, this is just the differences. You know, like this is things that are moving and maybe more detail in the static areas. Mm -hmm. So if you take a static scene, the very first frame will not always have all the detail. You, the next P frame that comes up, will add a little more detail if there's nothing moving. If there's something moving, it'll put most of the bits into tracking the moving thing. But if there's nothing moving, it just adds detail throughout the image. And so Stacy did a ton of different experiments with different uh, images and found that, you know, for certain, uh, for certain patterns, you didn't get the maximum amount of detail, the maximum accuracy until the fourth or the fifth or the sixth frame 
That's interesting. Because what it's a guess? static image and the iframe would be like JPEG compressed. And then you've got these differences, you know, the P and the B. And each time they would add a little more detail back, you know, because the, the theoretically, and you could force the encoder to put all of the bits into the iframe. But in practice, these encoders, they will be like, nope, I'm not going to put any more bits than this for mm -hmm. this iframe. But then it'll allocate a few more bits for the P frame, a few more bits for the B frame and so forth and you end up with more detail by making the by making the things you know a few frames long and then pause so mm -hmm. nine frames seemed like a good you Those know the magic cover the bases, magic. Cover the bases. Magic every static pattern was encoded 96 times with 96 different groups of settings and then for each pattern i picked the one that had the best settings so every pattern could be encoded i mean there's 96 different ways to encode or that were used on the disk yeah um last question from the group um is it okay is it okay to buy the disc and rip it for personal use we can't control what people do yeah easy enough <laughs> take that I mean, and run with it if you will i'm gonna say yes absolutely you know but just keep in mind that these are like nine frame long files so so if you hit play in a pc player for example it'll just flash and go away yeah sure. yeah gotcha well, guys, that hour blew by. I could talk to you forever. This is this is super cool stuff. Guys, if you don't have the disc, go out, grab it. It's 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 specially handy. Um, I always like to confirm my calibration work with actual content because uh, I'm in a lot of situations where um, maybe the sources aren't that great um, or maybe they're waiting on their Blu-ray player it hasn't shown up yet, whatever, whatever, whatever it might be. But um, I, I need to have something to confirm the calibration. And I, I, I really think it's very important to to do this if you calibrate the tv and your black levels are good but the black levels are crushed in the player then why do you just spend a couple hours at that person's house so we got to be able to confirm we have to be able to make sure the calibration actually went proper and in your sources you have to be able to set up like you said before which color space to use and, and, and that type of thing so this is part of my kit it's one of my tools i take it with me everywhere and i just want to thank you guys for doing such a kick-ass job on it it's it's awesome thank you Thanks for having me and I know I know it took a while because Stacy and I we saw each other at the shootout and it was like you were teasing me with a few things and you're like just be patient it's coming it's coming well, and we had a disc we, we thought we were close to to being done and that was in 2021 in October so was yes. that that was that the 2021 shootout yes wow that's crazy and then just in case if there's any last second questions let me check everybody's saying thank you so that's all I got guys thanks thanks a bunch for your time and uh, for that for the people who you said uh, for that question where you said to email you uh, should they just reach out on the website or yeah, there's a contact form on our contact website. Us. Yeah. Okay. Or Stacey, S-T-A-C-E-Y, at spearsandmunsell.com is what that will take you to. So. Oh, and spelled out A-N-D or the? Yes, A-N-D. Okay. You can't do an ampersand, I don't think, in, in an email name. So. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, good idea. So, so, URL. Okay. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Um, the What's the what's the website? Is it? Um, spearsandmunsell.com, spelled out A-N-D. And then uh, Jason's is uh, uh, medialight.com, right? If you want to get yeah. some more information on the bias light. Um, if you guys want to check it out, I did a long session with him just on bias lighting. So hit the YouTube channel and you'll see that one. Uh, tons of fun. Thanks again, guys. And um, yeah, we'll have to do this again someday. Our pleasure. All right. Cool. Thanks. Thanks.